blood donors, volunteers giving their blood for the benefit of others. It's a simple, painless business. A local anaesthetic is applied to the skin near a vein and a needle is then inserted and the blood run off. Any healthy person over 18 can be a donor. Four hundred and fifty milliliters of blood are taken. They measure it by weight, actually. She shakes the plastic bag to make sure the blood mixes with an anticoagulant inside so that it doesn't clot. It takes two to three minutes to collect the blood. Then, after a quarter of an hour or so's rest and a cup of tea, the donors can leave with no ill effects. From the blood donor centre, the fresh blood is taken to the laboratories, some of it for storage, some of it for processing. The blood to be stored is put into refrigerators at 4 degrees C, where it'll keep for up to 28 days. Plenty of healthy blood of the four main different blood groups must be available to serve the hospitals. You may like to find out about these different blood groups afterwards. A lot of the blood is processed to get different useful components out of it. First, it's put into a centrifuge and whirled round at about 2,000 revolutions per minute for a short time. This separates out some of the heavier constituents of the blood, which will end up at the bottom of the bags. The dark layer at the bottom is where all the red corpuscles have collected. This layer is often used to provide sick or injured people with a concentrated dose of red cells. You can also see a thin layer of shining material on top of this red layer. This contains the blood platelets which have to do with blood clotting. The blood in one single pack from one donor may go to as many as four different patients. For example, this clear yellow liquid, the blood plasma, is very valuable for people who've suffered serious burns or scalds. In the last film, we compared the body's blood circulating system to the transport network of a big city. Just as the city's roads and streets are needed to transport materials which the city and its people need to function properly, so the blood carries the materials our body must have if it is to stay alive. The blood carries oxygen in the oxyhemoglobin of the red blood corpuscles. Like the roads to the city, blood carries fuel which can be oxidized, burnt in the body by that oxygen to provide energy. And it carries building materials both for growth and to replace worn out tissues. It also carries the body's waste products which need to be carried away if we are to stay alive and healthy. Imagine this is a tiny capillary where loading and unloading goes on in the body. Oxygen is unloaded for the living cells of the tissues, and so are the food materials. As a result of the chemical processes which go on in the tissues, carbon dioxide is produced and is loaded into the plasma to be carried away back to the lungs. The other waste products also dissolve in the plasma and are carried away. This is the arterial system of a newborn baby. These are the main blood vessels from the heart which carry oxygen and food materials around the body to supply all the living cells. In the capillaries, too tiny to be shown, they are unloaded and waste products are taken aboard and carried away for disposal. One waste product, carbon dioxide, is carried to the lungs to be breathed out. The other waste products are dealt with in two very vital organs, the kidneys. Here they are, the two brown organs at each side of the two main blood vessels. Let's look at one of them. It's a highly efficient filter. Blood passes through many tiny separate filter units, and the waste products dissolved in it pass through into the pale area, leaving the purified blood to pass on around the body. The waste material, urine, passes down a tube called the ureter. There's one leading from each kidney, down to the bladder.
The bladder is a flexible muscular organ with a ureter leading into it at each side. It empties down the urethra at the bottom. This is actually inside the bladder. You can see urine coming down the ureters from the kidneys. It's dyed so that it shows up as it mixes with the urine already present in the bladder. Here's the other ureter. When the bladder's full, we empty it by relaxing a muscle which allows the urine to pass out down the urethra. Here's a cast showing the blood vessels in the kidneys. Each quite small organ does a complicated but essential job, cleaning the blood of waste products which would otherwise poison us. If both kidneys are injured or become diseased, it's possible to use an artificial kidney. It contains a set of these thin plastic bags through which the patient's blood is passed. The bags are normally sealed at the edges. When in use, they're bathed in a special fluid which flows around them and impurities pass out of the blood through the thin plastic bags into this fluid. The bags are separated by thicker plastic sheets. Here's an artificial kidney in use. The patient's blood is circulated through it for several hours at a time, several times a week. The two pipes in the middle carry the special cleaning liquid called the dialysis solution. The process is called renal kidney dialysis. This process enables a patient to live a fairly active life while the diseased or injured kidneys get better or until a kidney transplant is possible. In our daily lives, we're threatened by all sorts of dangers like injuries and invasion by dangerous bacteria and viruses. As well as oxygen in the red cells, food materials and waste products, our blood carries white corpuscles, which seek out and destroy certain of these invaders. Here, under the microscope, you can see a white cell, the large, shapeless body in the middle, surrounded by red corpuscles. It's about to engulf that long, thin body, which is an invading bacterium. Watch. If there's a large-scale invasion, we may need antibiotics, but our white cells give us a great deal of protection. Our blood has another protective mechanism, which we make use of when we're immunized against certain illnesses, such as tuberculosis or polio. This is especially useful against diseases caused by viruses, which are not affected by antibiotics. Suppose this is part of our blood circulation system. A disease-producing virus, or for that matter a bacterium, gets in, maybe through our lungs. The blood produces an antibody, a substance which destroys the invaders, and we should therefore not get the disease. But the antibody is only produced once this invader has got into the blood. The trouble is that if many of the disease-producing organisms get in, they may multiply, becoming more and more, before the antibodies can be formed to wipe them out. We become ill. What we need is to have the antibodies there all the time, ready to deal with the viruses or bacteria before they can multiply and cause damage. This is where immunization comes in. A vaccine is given, sometimes by mouth, as in the case of the vaccine against polio. Sometimes it's injected directly into the bloodstream. What is a vaccine? Well, it's actually a preparation of the disease-producing organism itself, which sounds crazy, but in fact it contains a changed form of the virus or bacterium, which only causes mild symptoms of the disease. It multiplies in the blood, and the blood produces the antibody, which destroys it. 
The antibody remains in the blood for some time, and as long as it's there, if we're attacked by the dangerous virus or bacterium, the invader will be wiped out before it can do any damage, because the defences are there, ready and waiting. There are other bodies in the blood which are very important. This is fresh, healthy blood being taken from a vein. At first, it's perfectly liquid, but tiny bodies called platelets in the blood take part in some very complicated chemical processes, which cause it to clot when it's in contact with a foreign body, such as the glass of this specimen tube. Look at it a short time later. This is why there has to be an anticoagulant, an anti-clotting substance in the packs containing blood from the blood donation centre. It's important that blood should be able to clot like this if we get an injury which damages any blood vessels. Suppose these are blood vessels near the surface of the skin. The skin gets cut like this and the cut fills with blood. The blood then clots inside the wound and other defence mechanisms come into action. A substance called fibrin is produced which forms a sort of stiff network across the wound. As the wound heals, the strings of fibrin contract, pulling the edges of the wound together. The blood supply through the blood vessels brings along building materials and soon the wound is healed, leaving only pale scar tissue. Small cuts and abrasions heal themselves. It's just a matter of keeping the area clean until healing has taken place. But more serious cuts and gashes need the right first aid immediately and expert help as soon as possible. A clean pad, tissues or a handkerchief will do, gripped firmly like this, will help stop the bleeding. And he keeps the injured part as high up as possible. This will also reduce the loss of blood. If the blood soaks through, don't try to remove the pad, which will destroy any clot that's formed. Just add another layer and stay like this until a doctor can stitch the wound to stop the bleeding completely and to help natural healing take place. Blood is a vital living organ. It forms the transport system in our bodies and without it, life would be impossible. That's why giving your blood for others when you become 18 is one of the best and most valuable offerings you can make. For the bloodstream is the very stream of life.